Good morning and welcome to the worship service of the Elm Street Congregational Church and to those of you who are watching by way of live streaming, we welcome you too. And uh, those of you who are on our mailing list have received the order of service for today. I want to mention a couple of important announcements. First of all, on the last Sunday of this month, I am announcing that we will have our annual uh, congregational meeting following the, uh, the 10 o'clock worship service. So we hope that it will not be uh, an extremely long meeting, but we have some business and annual reports will be mailed out along with the fiscal report from last, the last fiscal year and the budget that the trustees is recommending for the church. So please mark that on your calendars the last Sunday of this month. That's a two weeks notice. Um, this morning, I want to draw attention to all of you who worked so hard on the art sale yesterday. And Joanne, or do you want to say a word about how things went for that? There was an extraordinary amount of lugging because this was all outside. And, you know, I think it's just wonderful. Uh, I was able to stop by and just say hello, see how things were. Catherine had been there earlier to spend some of my money. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, my money, right. Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, this Saturday is the Bean Takeout Supper. So I want to, uh, if you saw the Enterprise, the ad is in the Enterprise. You have until 2 o'clock Friday to call your orders in. Pickup will be uh, Saturday 4 to 5 p.m. This morning, I'm going to begin preaching. A, uh, a series called Five Ways to Find Peace of Mind in Uncertain Times. And uh, we'll be looking at a variety of scriptures for that. And so, as we prepare our hearts now for worship, Mr. Fridell, if you would please. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 103, verses 1 to 12, a Psalm of David, and we will read this responsively. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. 
May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Our first hymn this morning is number 227 in the Pilgrim Hymnal, Fairest Lord Jesus. Please stand as you are able. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. 
which is inspired by the 32nd Psalm, and we will read this responsively. Our hearts are blessed as we gather before you today, O Lord, for you have given us freedom from all our transgressions and joy in exchange for heavy hearts. You are the refuge we seek when we are troubled and the courage we need when we venture into our days. Bless us today with your steadfast love as we declare our trust in you in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to say when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please join me in the litany. We will read this responsibly. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. Look at those who are honest and good, for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. And truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. Pray for the peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. He sends peace across your nation and satisfies your hunger with the finest wheat. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years, and your life will be satisfying. When people's lies please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord's uh, heaven's armies will make this happen. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. Our hymn is number 335 in the Pilgrim Hymnal, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Please stand if you are able.
gospel lesson today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Jesus calms the storm. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us! We're going to drown! Jesus responded, Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and waves obey him. The New Te Testament scripture lesson is from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Always be full of joy in the Lord, I say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus Christ. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. I am convinced that what the Bible says is true. That it is possible to find peace of mind during uncertain times. I really believe it. And I hope that you will too. Now we have looked at scripture and matched hymns with this theme this morning. Five ways to find peace of mind in uncertain times. I'm going to hit one of them this morning. So if you're looking for all five, you're going to have to keep coming back. There's a method to the madness with the white hair. I don't need to elaborate this morning on what's going on. But if I can describe our lives in this world, this morning as I stand behind this sacred desk, which the Bible calls the pulpit, I will tell you 
that it is the peace of God that will get this nation, this world, we as individuals and families to have peace of mind when we are facing uncertainty. Now, I know the uncertainties that are going on as well as you do nationally, internationally, and collectively as a nation. But I want to talk about what goes on for us when we recognize that we cannot control the future. We cannot control as much as we would like everything that is happening in our particular world and sphere of influence. I thought that when the kids grew up that it would become easier until I buried my first son after an extended illness 12 years ago. And then I thought it would be easier again when I buried my daughter in her late 30s in a shocking, unexpected death. I talked with her just the day before. I wish I could have controlled those things. But I could not. As much as I would like to see us having the capacity to only have good things happen in our lives, if I turn even in the first pages of the Bible, we run into the first fratricide where Cain kills Abel two brothers. The Bible is realistic. And while we are promised peace during our lifetime, peace is not the absence of problems. If we read the Bible, we'll see that people had lots of problems. Family problems marriage problems. The book of Job, which is a beautiful epic poem. Here's a good man who loses his entire family, loses everything in the first couple of chapters, and he has his wife who says to him, why don't you just curse God and die? That's why I, I think it's important to read the Bible. Because we can identify with the stories of these very human people with very real problems. In the gospel text this morning, you know the story and you know it well. Jesus had had a very tough day. Now this story is in Matthew and it's in Mark and then it's in Luke. And you read all three and scholars get in a hissy fit because there's some different details that one reports than another reports. Don't let that bother you. Think about a car accident for a moment. And it's at an intersection. And you have people witnessing this on different corners of the street. 
And one witness gives their perspective and another witness gives their perspective and another witness and the, uh, you know how it goes. Now it's all true, but they had their perspectives. Likewise, so did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And also bear in mind, these gospels were written 60 to 90 years later after the death and resurrection of Jesus. They had operated with oral tradition. And you know how that goes. The retelling of stories. But they're close. Jesus had, had a tough day. In one of the Gospels, he just heard that his, it was reported to him before he got in the boat that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod because he called out the man's sexual indiscretions and adulterous relationship with his sister-in-law. John the Baptist lost his head. Jesus said about that cousin, there was never a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Greater than Isaiah, greater than Jeremiah, greater than Ezekiel. Because prophets tell the truth. Now you can turn on the television and you'll hear people say, send me a thousand bucks to my ministry and God will heal you. I'll send you some kind of water from the Jordan River or I'll give you some special cloth. Let me tell you something that does not represent the, the God of the Bible and it is not true. And true prophets tell the truth. They call reality for what it is. And I'm here to say when they got in the boat, the most important verse to me as I was reading this over from the gospel in the first sentence, it says, then Jesus got into the boat. That's not just a descriptor of the actions of Jesus. It has far more weight than the idea of, well, Jesus got in the boat, Sam got in the car, Mary went into the house. It's not that level. Jesus got into the boat. And I'm here to say to you as a servant of God that Jesus needs to be in the boat of your life in order for you to face the uncertain things that are coming. I wouldn't want to get out of bed in the morning without knowing what a friend I have in Jesus. All my sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege it is to carry things, everything, everything to God in prayer. I wouldn't want to get up, get in a car, and face an uncertain day if I did not know Jesus was in my life. I'm not talking about a casual acquaintance or an occasional flirtation with the notion of Christianity. I'm talking about when you begin to realize how much we don't have control over what's going on in our lives, we need to ask Jesus to come into the boat of our lives and we need to trust that he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I trust that this morning. No matter what I have to go through, Whatever you have to go through, no matter what the disciples had to go through, Jesus needs to be in our lives. You say, well, how does that work? Ask him in prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, given the uncertainties of my life, not knowing what the next moment, phone call, doctor diagnosis, or trouble might happen 
in my world, my personal sphere of influence. I want you to be with me, and I trust you. This story is a story about who do you trust? What are you putting your reliance on? Yes, we have family. Yes, we have friends. Yes, we have those who care for us. And there are things we can do to help us reduce anxiety. Some people find help with yoga. Some people find help with deep breathing. Some people find help with meditation. Some people find help with journaling or doing art or whatever, and they're good things. But nothing will replace knowing that you've got a friend. Remember James Robinson I think it's James Taylor and, and um, Carly Simon sings it. You've got a friend. When Jesus is in the boat of your life and my life, we've got a friend. And the Bible says that he is a friend who sticketh closer than a brother. I really believe that this morning. For me, standing in this pulpit is not some kind of intellectual exercise that I can prove that I went to seminary and I can use words that aren't even in the dictionary. The gospel works and it works every day. And the word gospel means good news. And I want you to know no matter what, hear me and hear me clearly, no matter what you are going through this morning, I want you to know, as they sang in the 70s, put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. And I've done that. And why I have been preaching for over 50 years is because I still believe he's with me. These hymns that we sing, gospel songs, remind me of just what a friend I have. And when I'm in the garden, he's in the garden with me. When I'm on the job, he's with me. When good things happen, Jesus is with me. When I'm having a tough day, Jesus is with me. Come what may, we may experience fear like the disciples. And sometimes, like the disciples, Jesus, they found him taking a nap. That's how relaxed he was. And they asked him, don't you care? I want you to know, yes, he cares. Oh, yes, he cares. And he got up. But the biggest lesson of this was not that he calmed the storm. But the biggest lesson was that he wanted them to love him and trust him. And that's the bottom line for me. That's why the church needs to preach the gospel. The church does not need to be in politics. The church does not need to be in some ethereal kind of operation this morning. What the church needs to be doing is giving people hope. And I'm standing behind this pulpit to say to you this morning, if you trust Jesus and you ask him into your life and you rely upon him as you pray and read the stories of the Bible, let me tell you, you will find peace. The number one way to find peace of mind is in uncertain times is to trust in God. And that's not intellectual.
That's not cognitive. It's head and heart. He will not fail us. He will not forsake us. When Moses went to Egypt, he said, I'll go with you. When the three Hebrew children were in the fiery furnace, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar said, I see a fourth man like unto the Son of God. So whatever it is that we go through, I want you to know this morning, he's with us in the flood, in the fire, in the times of blessing, in the times of destitution, and he will get us through. And when we face that moment, which we're all going to face. <clears throat> we're all going to face some sooner than later. When we come to that moment, when we are surrounded by family and loved ones, and we are at the Jordan River, and we're about to cross over into the unknown, I want to remind you the words of Jesus which said in the 14th gospel, the chapter of the Gospel of John, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, you may be also. I don't know what that's going to look like. The Bible gives us some pictures and poetry and prophecy. But Paul wrote it best when he said, to be absent from the body, that meant to be dead is to be present with the Lord. And I trust that this morning. My hope is Jesus is in the boat of my life. My hope is I'm not in this life, game of life alone. People may disappoint me. Friends may be fair weather. They're in good times and not in so good of times. And sometimes even the most intimate relationships, spousal relationships, when fidelity is broken, when trust is lost, and you have to pick up the pieces and raise the kids by yourself, let me tell you there is a God who will be with you always. That's the hope that I have this morning. Hallelujah. I am not trusting in my own abilities, but I'm trusting in the God who gave me breath in the beginning. And when my time is over, I'm going home to see Jesus and loved ones. My beloved grandparents, Friends, my children who have gone on before, oh, they trusted Jesus too. And he's taking care of them. And for those of you who have lost loved ones as I have, rest assured, they're on the other side and someday you'll see them again. And oh, what a great reunion that will be. The first place to begin toward peace of mind in uncertain times is to say, Lord Jesus, I just want to make sure you're in the boat of my life. Money doesn't cut it. Stock market doesn't cut it.
All the good things I can do for self-care are not enough. What I need to know is, precious Lord, take my hand. Let's stand and sing it. It's on what page is that on? 70. Page 70 in the red folder. Precious Lord, take my hand. Stand as you're able. Let's sing it like we believe it. Precious Lord, take my hand. <clears throat> I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is all most gone, I cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall, my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. The day is past and gone. At the river I'll stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord. be seated. We'll take prayer requests now and praises. Anyone have a good report this morning? Uh, yes, uh, Anne. I talked to her when she was in Portsmouth yesterday. I said, please stay in the speed limit. And she said, yes, of course. I mean, what do you say to your minister, you know? <laughs> say, no, I'm gonna break all the speeding laws. But anyways, uh, she's going back because Louisiana has been hit so hard and there's an organization trying to feed 20,000 people every day in that area. And as a physician's assistant, she wants to be available to help people. So let's remember Jennifer with gratitude, but also for the work that she's going to do. Any other praise reports this morning? There are a number of prayer requests now, who's the young man, Lori? His name is Reno, and he's married to my niece, Brittany. All right. Uh, Reno Olette Jr., who's married to... No, that's his dad. Oh, I'm sorry. Reno Olette is, uh, has an uncle, a father, an uncle, a grandfather. His grandmother went home to the nursing home. And uh, all 
in the hospital. I asked, is this COVID related? And it is not, but they all have serious medical issues. And the grandmother was just released from the hospital and sent to a nursing home. So we're going to pray for Lori's extended family. There are people on the prayer list and let's keep them in our minds and hearts. And does anyone else have a request? Yes, Irene. People on the West Coast. This nation is being pummeled right now with uh, fires. When I was doing my uh, seminary work in Berkeley, uh, we had to be evacuated because the Berkeley Hills were on fire. It was nothing like what this is going on, but uh, it's an awful thing to watch your town go on fire. Some of these towns have been totally decimated. And so let's pray for the people and the first responders. And, and everybody's trying to figure out what to do with this. Other prayer requests this morning. Let us pray with faith and hope. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer right now? Loving God, you are a God of love. You are a God that we can trust. And we find and learn that through the lessons that we learn from the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray first and foremost that you receive our thanks for all the good things we have in life. That you receive our thanks that we can count on you during the tough times of life. We lift up these names that I've read this morning connected to Laurie Hunt, serious medical history issues. Be with each one of these folks as we pray. We pray for the people on the West Coast. Towns have been destroyed. People, don't, uh, people lost not only life possessions, but lives have been lost. And the nearly 200,000 people who have died from COVID in this nation, for the people who are still trying to get out of the results of the floods down south of Louisiana, bless Jennifer as she helps out in her home state of Louisiana. We pray also this morning for these who have gathered by way of the internet, these who have gathered in this house of worship, this church established in 1803. We thank you, O oh God, for this place and for those who have gone on before us in it. May we be faithful to preach the gospel. We ask, O oh God, this morning for those who are sitting in these pews <clears throat> and those who are watching by way of the internet, whatever burdens they are carrying, may they put their trust and make sure that Jesus Christ is in the boat of their lives and trust you, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Our offering receptacles are in the back of the church. We thank you for your faithfulness of giving. And for those of you by way of the internet who are sending your, your gifts to Box 878 in Bucksport. God bless you for that. In a moment, we're going to uh, have uh, the doxology. Laurie will lead us in the prayer of dedication, and then we'll go to the hymn of benediction. The doxology.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. We'll read this in unison. We are grateful, O oh God, for all of life's blessings. We offer unto thee these gifts with our heartfelt love and praise. May our lives be a blessing to others in our home, family, community, and world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. The hymn of benediction is number 22 in the red folder. It is well with my soul. Before I pronounce the benediction, I want to just draw your attention to the postlude and invite after we sing the sung response to the benediction, those of you who care to might want to just sit down and listen to this piece that Mr. Fridell's father wrote as David performs it on the organ. Uh, it's your choice. But I'd like to be for us to hear it if you uh, are interested, because I'm sure. And, and Mr. Fridell, we thank you so much for sharing the music of your father today. You don't know this, but some of the hymns in the hymn, in our Pilgrim Hymn Book were composed by Mr. Fridell's father, an exquisite Episcopalian organist in the state of New York composer extraordinaire and certainly we are so fortunate to have Mr. Fridell with us every week as our regular organist. Now as Moses blessed Israel I bless you with peace. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.